Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Summer Ingram Dean. I am the staff attorney at the Student Press Law Center. This presentation is designed to help you identify and avoid some of the most common privacy law traps faced by student media. This presentation will not make you a First Amendment expert. What it will do, I hope, is help you make more informed decisions and give you a better sense of when you might have a problem that requires outside help. For those situations, you may want to keep the contact information for the SPLC handy. The SPLC is a nonprofit organization founded nearly 50 years ago based in Washington, D.C. The center provides free legal help and information to student journalists and their advisors on a variety of media law issues. We're going to talk today about privacy law, but the center is ready to help you answer questions on pretty much any media law issues, including things like censorship, access to public records and meetings, libel, and privacy. More information is available on our website, splc.org, and in various resources produced by the center. You can also use our free hotline service to submit an email or schedule a telephone call with myself or one of the other members of our legal team. So let's get started. Privacy law basically asks the question, how far is too far when covering the news? The law recognizes that everyone has, under certain circumstances, a legal right to simply be left alone. It provides that there are certain subjects, certain places, and certain actions that are nobody else's business. On the other side, however, the law also recognizes that at some point, a person's right to privacy can give way to other important interests. For example, many seemingly private things that people do can significantly affect others, and the public has a right or need to know about them. <clears throat> in the parlance of journalism, such information is said to be newsworthy. Invasion of privacy law is very often about balancing these two sometimes competing interests. While the law can vary by state, courts have generally recognized four different types of invasion of privacy. The first is public disclosure of private and embarrassing facts. The second is intrusion. The third is false light. And the fourth is misappropriation. We'll cover each in turn. It is important to note that the kind of invasion of privacy claims journalists and media organizations have to be concerned about are distinct from invasion of privacy claims made against government agencies. The right to privacy from government intrusion, which can be based on rights found in the United States Constitution, uh, requires a different sort of analysis that this presentation will not cover. So the first and for student journalists, probably the most important and troublesome type of invasion of privacy is the public disclosure of private and embarrassing facts. In this country, we hold dear our constitutionally protected right to freely speak or write what's on our minds, including the right to talk about others. But we're also increasingly protective of our right to control access to and disclosure of information about our own private lives. lives. It's when these two rights collide that a privacy lawsuit can result. Indeed, at their core, all public disclosure cases address one very important and complicated question. At what point does the right to publish truthful information about a person give way to that person's right to be left alone, free from embarrassment or unwanted publicity? The first step for courts in deciding whether or not there's been an unlawful disclosure of private and embarrassing facts is to determine whether the person claiming the violation had what's called a reasonable expectation of privacy. In other words, is the information at issue the type that most people would think should be off limits to public disclosure? Like our poor friend here in the bathtub, courts recognize that we all need to have a place we can go or keep things to ourselves that are nobody's business but our own. To answer that question of the reasonable expectation of privacy, courts have required the person bringing the claim to show three things. First, the person must show that the information published was sufficiently private. Information about a person that is already known by people outside of a small circle of friends and family or information that could easily and lawfully be discovered will generally not support a private facts privacy claim. For example, a student making a privacy claim will have a hard time winning his case if he's already voluntarily revealed the alleged private information to dozens of his friends and teachers. In addition, material that can lawfully be obtained from public records will rarely be considered private. For example, a person generally has no privacy right to keep recent details about their alleged or actual criminal conduct secret, 
and information about that person found in arrest records, police reports, and court documents, as long as it's fairly and accurately reported, will not result in a valid privacy claim. Next, a person must show that the information is sufficiently intimate. In other words, the information revealed must be of the type most people tend to want to keep to themselves. For example, while disclosing a person's date of birth or favorite color may reveal private details about that person, few would consider it intimate information. On the other hand, revealing facts about a person's personal grooming habits, mental health history, or other private details that a person does not ordinarily reveal about themselves are at the center of a private facts complaint. Finally, the revealed information must be highly offensive, even shocking to a reasonable person. The good news is that this is usually the type of information that should set off, um, set off your alarms as a journalist prior to publication anyway. Uh, for example, providing graphic details about a person's, person's private sex life, disclosing that an otherwise private person has a medical condition or has obtained treatment for a problem that they've not publicly revealed before, or publishing detailed information about a person's grades when there is no legitimate or newsworthy reason for doing so would be examples of this type of invasion of privacy. For example, revealing that a classmate has an embarrassing medical condition that he has likely tried hard to keep private is something that would probably deeply offend and humiliate most people were the information published about them. On the other hand, information about a person that is just mildly embarrassing um, or information that they just maybe wish hadn't gotten out to the public is generally insufficient to support a private facts claim. For example, even though an English teacher might be mildly bothered that you reveal that she enjoys reading cheesy romance novels on the weekends, few people would be humiliated or shocked by such a disclosure to the level that the law requires. One of the big problems for media is that unlike with a libel claim, um, it's no defense to a private facts claim that the information is true. Rather, it's simply that you cross the line in publishing the information. True details about a private matter can embarrass a person just as much and sometimes more than fictional details. Rather than truth, two primary defenses to a private facts claim are newsworthiness and consent. First, we'll look at newsworthiness. In their attempt to balance the competing rights in an invasion of privacy case, courts have settled on one key question. Is the information newsworthy? If the information is a matter of public concern or interest, its publication cannot be a public disclosure of private facts, no matter how embarrassing it is. That means that almost any information about a well-known public figure or public official will be considered newsworthy. On the other hand, a private person has a higher expectation of privacy and her life is less open to scrutiny. However, even an otherwise private person's secrets may be newsworthy and reportable when they are closely connected to a significant public issue or event. Unfortunately, determining whether otherwise private information is newsworthy and therefore safe to publish is not always easy. The following examples should help. Suppose an unknown, an unknown source slips two packages under your newsroom door. Each contains the transcripts of certain students at your school and you write two separate stories. As discussed earlier, revealing detailed information about students' grades or academic records without their consent could be considered an invasion of their privacy. But your reasons for the publishing the stories could matter greatly. If your only reason for publishing is merely to satisfy your reader's curiosity or appetite for gossip, you could be in trouble. For example, if in your first story you report that 24 random students are having serious academic problems, there is no or very little legitimate public interest or concern that these specific students who are neither public figures or officials and who are not involved in a significant public issue are receiving failing grades. In fact, their academic problems are really nobody's business but theirs, and publicly revealing such information could be highly offensive and embarrassing to the students. In this case, the newsworthiness of the information is low and is almost certainly outweighed by the privacy interests of the students. The 
The second package, however, contains the transcripts of two starting players on your school's state championship basketball team. Assuming the transcripts are genuine, they reveal that the students played basketball while academically ineligible, something that could cost the team its state title. Even though you are publishing the same private information, in this case, academic information about named students whose disclosure will seriously embarrass them, the news value and public interest in knowing this information would almost certainly outweigh the privacy interest of the students and shield you from a successful invasion of privacy claim. As I mentioned earlier, another defense to most invasion of privacy claims is consent. So if you want to do a story that involves a private and intimate details of a person's life, such as a story on sexual abuse, teenage pregnancy, substance abuse, family problems, grades, or sexual orientation, it is always a good idea to obtain the consent of your subject first. If a person consents to your publishing otherwise private information about them, they generally cannot later claim that you invaded their privacy. And asking for consent, be candid with your subject about what information you want to use and how you plan to use it. Also, make sure you obtain consent from someone with the legal right to give it. For example, police do not have the authority to invite reporters onto private property. School officials cannot automatically give consent for students. Parents cannot automatically give consent for their children. And employers cannot automatically give consent for their employees. Finally, get the consent in writing. While verbal consent is legally valid, it can be much harder to prove. A question of particular interest to student media is whether or not minors, typically people under the age of 18, can validly consent without a parent to stories about themselves that could invade their privacy or libel them. While the issue is relatively new, courts have generally ruled that minors can provide valid consent as long as they understand what they are doing and the probable consequences of providing such consent. Under this view, most high school students and certainly most college students should provide valid consent. Most elementary age students, because of their immaturity, probably could not. When the consent of a minor is in question, it's important that the journalist seriously analyze whether the minor is mature enough to appreciate the risks involved. Intrusion is the next type of invasion of privacy claim. Unlike the other categories, intrusion claims are not based on what you publish, but rather on how you obtained or gathered the information in the first place. In fact, a journalist can be successfully sued for intrusion even when he does not publish the information he obtained. The Illegal News Gathering Act is itself the basis for the claim. Don't forget about our guy in his bathtub. An intrusion privacy violation occurs when a reporter gathers information about a person in a place where that person has a reasonable right to expect privacy. In fact, the idea in an intrusion case is fairly simple. When a person is in a place where he or she has a reasonable right to expect privacy, a reporter or photographer must respect that right. Reporters have no special privilege to invade another's zone of privacy to gather the news. Determining when a person has a reasonable expectation of privacy is sometimes an easy call. For example, you can't reasonably expect privacy when you're walking down a busy campus sidewalk, um, if you're in a public park or somewhere like a football game. In these spaces, you are, in a legal sense, fair game for photographers or journalists who wish to report what is done and said in those public spaces. In fact, journalists in a public space generally have the right to record and report on pretty much anything that they can see or hear on their own without help from special audio or video gadgetry. Even those engaged in otherwise private activities generally lose their reasonable expectation of privacy and hence their ability successfully to sue if they engage in those activities in a public setting. On the other hand, some places are clearly private. A person's home and bedroom, bathrooms, school locker rooms, hospital rooms, or private office would all be examples of clearly private spaces. In between the public sidewalk and the private bathroom, however, are situations that are not so clear cut, leaving courts to decide how public or private the space is. For student journalists who do so much of their work on school property, the question can get especially complicated. 
While school hallways and cafeterias would probably be considered public spaces, allowing a student journalist to report what happens there freely, it's less clear, for example, whether students in a classroom would be able to claim that they have a reasonable expectation of privacy to be free from news gathering activities. In such close cases, a photographer or reporter would probably be wise to obtain the permission of the teacher and make his or her presence known to the students, giving them an opportunity to excuse themselves prior to shooting or collecting information in a classroom. Generally, intrusion claims fall into three categories. There's trespass, secret surveillance, and misrepresentation. With trespass, again, the idea here is that there are certain private places that should be off limits to others, including reporters and photographers, unless a person has given you permission to be there. Examples of trespass include entering a crime scene on private property without valid permission, secretly peeking into or otherwise spying in a private space, climbing a high fence, picking a door lock or otherwise breaking into private property without the consent of the owner. Intrusion invasion of privacy claims can also result from hacking into a private computer or voicemail system to gather information without authorization. As a general rule, reporters have the right to enter privately owned public spaces, think private school campuses and shopping malls, for example. Um, reporters generally have the right to enter these spaces without permission that they must leave or stop gathering information if asked to do so. Note, however, that as the reporter or photographer, you're entitled to retain any notes or photos you obtain prior to being asked to leave. Be careful, however, because de determining what a public space on private property is can be tricky. For example, at least one court has ruled that the news media does not have the right to film inside a privately owned restaurant without prior permission of the owner. Second type of trespass claim is uh, secret surveillance. So that's where you are using any sort of bugging equipment, hidden cameras or other electronic aids to help you see activities going on that would otherwise be private. The final type of intrusion invasion of privacy is misrepresentation. This kind of claim can occur when a journalist misrepresents himself to gain access to a private place or person, such as posing as a hospital worker to get an interview with a patient or obtaining consent in a private place from someone not authorized to give that consent. Note that undercover reporting is not necessarily an invasion of privacy, as long as the disguise is not used as a means to trespass or engage in activity you would not otherwise be allowed to do. For example, it's probably not an intrusion for a minority student reporter to pose, pose as an applicant to a fast food restaurant to investigate a story about employment discrimination. As long as she answers the application questions truthfully, the reporter has a right to apply whether she is serious about taking the job or not. For most reporting, however, good legal sense suggests and professional ethics demands that journalists identify themselves as reporters and explain to their sources that the information they obtain may be used in a news story. Another example of undercover reporting is a student pretending to want to rush a fraternity or sorority in order to report on the rush process. This student could likely pretend to want to be a member of this group and answer honestly, answer honestly about the things they ask, but not reveal that they're a reporter. As with the public disclosure of private facts claim, newsworthiness and consent are also the primary defenses to an intrusion lawsuit. Again, obtaining consent is uh, in, in obtaining consent, it is important to make sure the person giving consent has the authority to do so. It's also important not to lie or misrepresent oneself in order to obtain consent. The third category of invasion of privacy claims is known as false light. Simply stated, a false light claim can arise anytime you unflatteringly portray in words or pictures a person as something that he or she is not. Not all states recognize a false light claim because in many ways, it simply duplicates a libel claim and that harm occurs when you publish words or images about an individual that portrays them falsely. A common example of false light would be publishing an extremely misleading photo caption. 
For instance, a photo caption that states or clearly implies that onlookers at a KKK rally are participants would certainly put them in a false light. Or as you see here on the screen, using a photo of an innocent person using a computer to illustrate a story on computer hacking could also result in a false light claim. Another common false light mistake is carelessly using an old file photo to illustrate a story in a way that falsely suggests a person is currently engaged in unflattering conduct. For example, illustrating a current story about violations of a newly adopted dress code with a file photo taken before the code was adopted and at a time when the subject's dress was permissible would put the students in a false light. Publishing a fake or forged letter to the editor that attributes opinions to an individual that he does not hold can also generate a false light claim. To avoid such problems, newsrooms are wise to adopt a policy requiring that the identity of outside contributors be verified before publication. This is especially important for email submissions, which can easily be faked. The final category of invasion of privacy claims is also the easiest to identify and avoid. You can get in trouble for misappropriation when you use another person's name, image, voice, or other likeness to help sell something without their permission. The main hotspot here is, of course, advertising and commercial endorsements. It doesn't make any difference whether the person is famous or not. Everyone has the right to control how their image is used when it comes to advertising and endorsements. If you want to use a picture of someone or their name, voice, or anything else that is identified with them in an ad to help sell something, you first have to get their permission. It's as simple as that. It should be standard practice to obtain a signed model release form before creating and publishing any ad that pictures identifiable people. If the subject is a minor and money is involved, you should also obtain permission from the minor's parent or guardian. If you publish an ad created and submitted by a third party, you may want to first have them sign an agreement stating that valid permission has been obtained and that they will be responsible for reimbursing you for any claims that might result if a problem arises. So that is the end of the presentation. Of course, we haven't covered everything. You may have more questions, but as I noted earlier, the SPLC website is packed full of resources um, on student press law issues. And you can also schedule time to talk one-on-one -on -one with myself or one of our other lawyers using our free legal hotline. On behalf of the Student Press Law Center, I thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. We hope you have found it helpful.